So today I'm going to introduce our work, Simon. Uh, so our system is about uh, measuring uh, accurate queue sizes in the network from the edge of the data center network. So this work is done together with Xu Yu, Zi, Ashish, Balaji, Mendo, and Amin. So network measurement and monitor monitoring has been a long-standing and important problem, and is useful for for many things, for example, network health monitoring, traffic engineering, capacity planning, uh, troubleshooting, and uh, detecting anomalies. Uh, the main challenges in network measurement include accuracy, scalability, and speed. Since these are really all conflicting requirements, most solutions seek to make effective tra trade-offs. So there are uh, generally two classes of network measurement uh, methods in the, in the literature. The first class is called switch-based measurement. So tra traditionally, we have a syslog and SNMP for pulling switch power counters, and also NetFlow and SFlow for like collecting flow level stats. And more recently, we have uh, in-band network telemetry, which enables collecting per pack information on every hop of the, you know in the network. So the, these switch-based algorithms are gen generally uh, very uh, you know. They, they are widely av available and they can be very accurate, especially for in-band tel telemetry. However, these methods require uh, hardware support. They are local to the switch, so you need to assemble a global view across the switches. And as, as soon as you get per packet information uh, in in-band telemetry, and the overhead of uh, you know, uh, storing and transferring and processing the data can be huge. The second class of methods uh, are called edge-based uh, measurement. There are lots of research in the in this you know uh, class too. Uh, some example ones include trumpet, uh, W7, ping mesh, and so on. So these uh, methods are gen generally more uh, flexible si since they are not tied to switches. Uh, however, m most of them only support obtaining uh, partial views into the network. For example, you can get delayed distributions. Uh, in the network, uh, you know, for some intervals like 10 seconds to a minute, and you, you can identify lossy links. So compared to the switch-based methods, they are not as accurate. So our work, Simon, falls into the edge-based measurement category. So we use data gathered entirely at the edge of the network. However, we try to reconstruct the near exact queuing dynamics in the network in addition to the you know, queuing distributions. So here is what we mean by uh, near exact reconstruction. So this figure on the left is, uh, uh, is a, a queue from a 10G network in a, in a 3 simulation. The queue is sampled at every one microsecond. So it's basically packet in queuing and dequeuing times. So this is a, like a, a you know, high sampling rate you know, of the queue. So the figure on the right is the same queue uh, that you know, the same queuing process that averages over one millisecond uh, intervals. Uh, basically, every time we take a thousand points from the left, add them up, and divide by a thousand, and we get the figure on the right. So we can see that this one millisecond average queue signal actually captures almost all the fluctuations in the queuing process, except for some high frequency jitter in the you know in the queue. However, we can see that the the, the you know noise ratio or the jitter is small relative to the queue sizes. So thus, the figure on the right is actually our reconstruction target because it's uh, much simpler and scalable to reconstruct. So we will first try to reconstruct the, the overall queuing uh, delays in the queues, and then we will try to break down this queuing delay uh, into uh, individual flows. And then further, we will try to get the link utilization break down to individual flows too. So it turns out this one millisecond average queue, queue uh, signal is uh, can be useful for many problems. Uh, for example, we can use it to understand the traffic pattern of an application and its impact on the network. So we can investigate and, you know, the networking inter interference among multiple applications. And we can, of course, identify congested links and corporate applications. And we can also do some you know, congestion control on it because we really want to control the real congestion in the network we don't want to you know, control the jitters. And there are many other applications too. So if you look at the you know, one millisecond averaging operation uh, in the frequency, fre frequency domain, 
what we are do doing is uh, you know actually passing the you know queuing uh, signal uh, into a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of uh, 500 hertz. So if we do uh, if you compute the uh, power spectral density of the one microsecond signal and the one millisecond signal following these equations, we will get this figure. So the x-axis is frequency, and y-axis is the power spectral density. And the yellow curve is for the one microsecond signal, and the blue curve is for the one millisecond signal. We can see that for the one microsecond si signal, the major majority of the power of the signal concentrates in the Low, fre low frequency part. Uh, by low frequency, now we mean uh, smaller than 500 hertz. And also, we can see that the one uh, millisecond average signal captures almost all the low frequency part of, this, you know, of the one microsecond signal. So in fact, the one millisecond uh, you know, signal preserves over 97.5% of the power of the one microsecond signal. So in this figure, the x-axis is the uh, the average interval, right? So previously we had one millisecond fixed, and then now you know at the, the on the x-axis we can you know vary the averaging interval, and the y-axis shows the fraction of the preserved power. So we have three curves: the blue curve is for 1G networks, uh, green curve is for 10G, and red curve is for 40G. We look at the green curve uh, for uh, first. This is for for 10G network. So these horizontal and the vertical lines uh, basically shows that at one millisecond averaging interval, we can preserve over, uh, not over, like exactly 97.5% uh, of the power. And as we increase this averaging interval, we will start to quickly lose power. And if the average interval is smaller than one millisecond, we don't have much gain. So this is saying the one millisecond is actually the sweet spot for uh, 10G networks. And similarly, for 1G and 40G networks, the sweet, 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 sweet spot averaging interval so are uh, 10 milliseconds and 250 microseconds, respectively. So, so this is saying the, uh, the ideal averaging interval is actually inversely proportional to the link speed of the network. So intuitively, this is easy to understand. So if you have higher speed links, the queues will will like vary faster, and thus you will want to reconstruct the queues uh, more frequently. Uh, so in our system, we call this uh, averaging interval our reconstruction interval. So what we do is, uh, you know, we reconstruct the queue sizes. Uh, you know, for time, like uh, recall interval by recall interval, and uh, in each interval, we try to reconstruct the average queuing delays, uh, you know, in the queues. So this picture shows uh, how our system works on a high level. So suppose server A sends a packet to server B through the network, and we the two servers collect collect the transmit and receive timestamps of the packet. So assuming the clocks are synchronized. Um, these two timestamps will tell us the one-way delay uh, of the packet. In fact, we, last year NSDI we published a, published a paper for clock synchronization, so we used that to synchronize the clocks. Um, so our goal is to uh, break down this one-way delay onto the you know individual hops in the network. And assuming the Q1 through Q5 are the five queues passed by the uh, packet in the network, so Using this packet, we can we can have the equation that the one-way delay of the packet, which equals to the received timestamp minus the transmit timestamp, equals to sum to the sum of the queuing delays in the five queues plus a noise term. So the noise term here models uh, the variable switch switching delays in the switches, as well as uh, maybe the small propagation delays on the wires. So with this single packet, we have one equation for f five variables. So there's no way that we can solve for the queuing delays. Uh, if you look at, for example, a second packet that passes through the network, uh, we can ha have a, you know, a, a second equation. So in our example, the second packet passed through the same the the the, the first two queues of the first packet and the th and three new queues. So using the second packet, we, ha we can have a second equation. So like this, we can gather many packets and write down all the equations and try, try to solve for the queues. So formally, the input to our algorithms include the five tuples of the packets, 
uh, and the uh, timestamps of, of the packet. We assume that from the five tuples, we can know the path taken by the packet, and from the timestamps, we can know the one-way one -way delay uh, of the packets. And for each packet, we know the equation that the one-way delay equals to the sum of the queuing delays plus prop propagation delay. And uh, if we uh, gather a bunch of the packets, we can have a linear system like this. So D here is a vector of one-way delays, and A is a matrix that specifies which uh, packets uh, pass through which queues. And the queue is a vector of queuing delays, and N is the noise term. So, it, so however, uh, unfortunately, in uh, factory networks, this uh, linear system is always underdetermined, meaning we can never have enough equations to solve the, the queues in the network. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we know that congestion in network is sparse, uh, meaning the queue vector here is sparse, so that we can use the classical Lasso estimator to estimate the queues uh, in this equation. So our first attempt, attempt was to uh, reconstruct the queuing delays using the you know the data packets, which are the packets generated by the applications. So these uh, three figures are uh, the three queues from a simulation. Uh, the x-axis is time, y-axis is uh, queue, the the queue, queue length. So the blue curve is the ground truth queue length in the, in the simulation, and the red filling. Uh, is the reconstruction results. We can see that uh, sometimes the reconstruction matches the uh, ground truth pretty well. However, other times the algorithm is uh, you know, uh, attributing the data into the wrong queues. This is because with only data packets, there's not enough equations compared to the variables. Uh, so, so in fact, this is because uh, even though there's a large number of data packets, M many of them are passing through the same path because packets from the same flow go through the same path, right? So, so the path coverage in the network is not enough for us. So thus, we introduce a pro mesh. So in the pro mesh, each each server ran randomly picks ten probing bodies, and in each reconstruction interval, so each server sends one probe to each of its body, and every probe is act. And the probing overhead is uh, roughly 0.1% of the line rate. So by using this, this probe, probe mesh, basically we can use a small number of packets to uh, create a dense coverage of the path, path in the network. The second uh, attempt uh, was to reconstruct the queue sizes using only probe timestamps. And this time we leave the data packets alone. So these are the you know reconstruction results. As you can see, the reconstruction matches um, ground truth pretty well, and the uh, and the average reconstruction error is 5.2 kilobytes, which is you know three to four M2 size packets in the internet. Um, so the algorithm we used, which is Lasso, is a uh, like an optimization uh, optimizer, uh, and its uh, its solver is iterative, which means when you have a large network, you know it takes time to solve the problem, and th thus we used a uh, uh, neural network to try to speed up the uh, speed of uh, Lasso. So the the idea is, so initially we used Lasso to do the reconstruction. So as you know the probe timestamps come in we feed the probe, probe timestamp to both Lasso and the neural network. And then we can use the output of, new, of the Lasso to, tr to tr you know, to we take the output of Lasso as the output of the uh, neural network and we use these data to train the neural network. And after we have trained the neural network, when new probe timestamps come in, we can then use the output of the new neural network as a uh, reconstruction result. So this figure shows the accuracy of neural network compared to Lasso. So the first column column is for Lasso, the second column is for a neural network trained with ground truth, and the third column is for a neural net network trained with Lasso. We can see that for the neural network trained with ground truth, it actually performs better than Lasso because Lasso is an open uh, loop uh, solver, and neural network actually had access to the ground truth, so it learns the dis distribution of the data. And if we train the neural network with Lasso output, we can see that you know the accuracy we don't lose much accuracy. So this table summarizes the speed up of uh, neural network compared to Lasso. Uh, as you can see, Lasso takes a long time to solve, and neural network is much faster. 
neural networks faster because first of all, there are you know algorithms. So so neural networks very simple multiplic multiplication and additions and can be you know sped up by GPUs. And the lasso is inherently iterative. Even if we put lasso on the GPUs, it takes many iterations, right? And for lasso, we, ha we only have two iterations. So neural networks is you know, almost always much faster than lasso. So empirically, uh, neural, network neural networks give us uh, 5,000 to 10,000 times the speed up without losing much accuracy. So, so far, we've used the probe packets to reconstruct the queues, but we still don't know the link utilizations uh, and whose packets are in the queues and whose packets are using the links. And now it's time to use the data packet timestamps too. So the way, d the way we do this is, uh, so now we already, ha we already say no the queuing delays in the queues in the network. And suppose we know the transmit timestamp uh, of a data packet, we can then pretty much simulate this data packet through the network and know where this packet is at any point of time. And if we do this for every data packet, we can then have a full-on reconstruction of the queuing that dynamics in the network. So this can be costly because it, this is a you know, per packet uh, operation. So in reality, we uh, only need to use the, you know, the byte counts per flow to do this reconstruction. But the idea is similar. So these are again the you know reconstruction results uh, compared to uh, you know simulation ground truth. Uh, so now instead of breaking the, you know things down by flows, which can be messy, we are you know because they're, they're, you know it's gonna it's hard, hard, harder to render you know on the on the figure. We now break down the flows by destination racks. So the blue cur uh, the uh, black curves uh, are the simulation ground truth for different classes of traffic, and the uh, color fillings are the reconstruction results. Uh, you know, as previously, the reconstruction is pretty accurate. It's accurate to a couple of uh, amplitude size packets. And these two figures are the reconstruction of the liquid utilizations uh, for the same queues. And we see that the, you know, the reconstruction error is within 1% uh, of the uh, link utilizations. So we have uh, deployed and tested this algorithm, in this system. Uh, first of all, in a Google Jupyter uh, 40G testbed using 20 racks and a three-layer network. And also another uh, much larger network where we had 10G and 40G links. Uh, we had access to 12 out of hundreds of racks, and it's a five-layer network. Uh, at Stanford, we built ourselves a, a small testbed using uh, these equipments. We used, we tried to use the bottom of the line um, Cisco switches, and we used the dongles we bought off the internet to act as uh, servers. And we built a 128 server two-layer network, a 1G, uh, you know, testbed. So the idea is is to say that if we can, you know, do reconstruction, do measurement in this network, you know, hopefully we can do it at, uh, anywhere. So this is our verification method at Stanford. We used FPGAs to get a queuing uh, delay ground truth from the network. So the idea is that we use one FPGA as two timestampers. A packet will first go to the FPGA. We take a, take a timestamp time of it. Then the packet will go to the, go into the switch and come out of the switch and go into the FPGA again with the, uh, w from where we get a second timestamp. Using the two timestamps, we can know the ground truth queuing delay of the packet in the, in the switch. And in this testbed, we had two FPGAs, and uh, from the two FPGAs, we got uh, ground truth for four different queues in the testbed. So this is the power spectral density of the you know ground truth data. As you can see, it um, uh, matches the simulation pretty well, and uh, you know the majority of the power is concentrated in the low frequency part and the. Uh, 10 millisecond average is 10 millisecond because this is time is uh, like a 1G network. The 10 millisecond average signal captures uh, the majority of the uh, you know uh, the low fre frequency power. So in this figure, the uh, the uh, yellow curve is the ground truth from FPGAs. The blue curve is the uh, 10 millisecond average uh, ground truth, and the red curve is the lasso reconstruction results. And we see that you know uh, the reconstruction matches. Uh, the uh, ground truth uh, very well. Uh, in this figure, the x axis is the load in the network, and the y axis is the uh, reconstruction uh, error. As you can see, as the load grows larger, we do have slightly larger reconstruction error. However, um, 
it's always uh, on the order of a couple of um, you know M2 size packets. So for, for now, I've covered the some main ideas in the paper, uh, but there are like a, a more ideas in the paper. Uh, for example, uh, we like in the in the uh, Google 40G testbed and in the in the other like large testbed, we uh, used a cross validation scheme to verify that our algorithm is giving the you know uh, you know correct results. Um, and there are other uh, you know uh, problems we study. For example, you know how does the pro mesh scale with the size of the network and uh, there, and there's another way that we can speed up reconstruction fo following the hierarchy in, you know, in the network and so on. So this con concludes my talk. So basically we use a uh, pro mesh, which has a very low uh, on your bandwidth overhead. And using pro packets, we can reconstruct the queue length in the network. And then using data packet timestamps, we can reconstruct, we can decompose the queues and links um, by uh, on a per flow basis. And we have Finally, we have verified our uh, system using FPGAs and cross-validation. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Um, okay. While people are getting up for questions. Um, so I actually was a bit curious about something. So in using a DNN for training uh, for replacing lasso haven't you built in assumptions about the topology because you're learning from that so what happens when you have failures or what happens with things like what is the equivalent of concept drift for uh, this type of DNN you're training here so what happens when failures happen what happens when traffic patterns change uh, yeah so 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 definitely so uh, in fact, in, in Lasso, we needed access to the A matrix, which captures the uh, topology of the network. And the uh, neural network is, in fact, uh, learning uh, is is uh, is assuming that the topology of the network and the and the routing doesn't change in, in the network. So there are uh, two questions brought by uh, Arojit. Uh, the first question is how how does the neural network uh, perform when you have different traffic patterns? So we actually, you know, try to train the neural network with different traffic patterns, and it turns out. So if say, for example, if you train the neural network, neural network with in-cast, in uh, you know, traffic, and then we apply it for long-lived flows, it actually performs pretty well. However, if we, uh, you know, retrain the neural network with the, with the new data, it can perform better, right? So it's, it's uh, uh, definitely, you know, learning the you know traffic pattern itself, and. Uh, the more uh, you know traffic pattern it, it sees, it learns from, the better it does you know on all different types of traffic patterns. The second question is how does the neural network perform uh, or uh, you know under network failures? So there are basically like two types of network failures. The first type is, for example, there are like packet jobs. We don't have we don't have say, for example we don't have the full input to the neural network. In that case, we are, we actually have ways to uh, you know. To using the, new, the 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 same neural network to combat these packet jobs, uh, so so this is an easier case. The harder case is where we have a route, routing changes in the in the network and topo topology changes. In in which case we will need to retrain the neural network. However, retraining the neural network can be very slow uh, if you we use the neural network uh, you know naively. Uh, so, so how we did it is uh, we basically uh, combine neural networks with uh, another idea called the hierarch hierarchical reconstruction. Basically, we break down the network into subnets right. and we train it. Let's, um, let's take the next question. Yeah, actually. for smaller networks. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, uh, Noah Zilberman, University of Cambridge. So, if I'd like to run uh, cloud measurements myself and extract queuing. Can, can I do it in any way? Does it depend entirely on the fact that you uh, synchronize all the machines? So how is it uh, applicable or usable also for you know users that are not within Google? Oh yeah. So the the two requirements for our system, first of all, is uh, we we need to know the uh, path taken by the packets, and uh, we need you know, to know. Can you please repeat that? The the first requirement is, is that we need to know the path taken by, by the packets. Um, and we, we, can, we can typically typically know that from, uh, for example, trace route, right? And it, this re re depends on the different you know uh, platforms, different environments. And the second is clock synchronization, uh, which is required for us to you know figure out the one we deliver the packets from the timestamps. Uh, last year we published a paper on clock synchronization, which which is you know which works pre pretty much uh, universally. 
and we have uh, tested the clock synchronization also in you know many different environments, and that that should you know be so. Not so not if I run a measurement in a Google Cloud, should I assume that the machines are synchronized? Yeah, sure. So, so in fact, we can uh, synchronize uh, clocks in Google Cloud down to uh, one microsecond. I'm not asking if you can. I'm asking as, as a someone that measures. Can yeah. I assume that they are? Synchronized? Yeah, definitely. We we re require uh, clock synchronization. Uh, in, in this system. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you mind taking it offline? Uh, Dmitry Afanas, Yandex. Uh, one more question about uh, knowing topology. You mentioned that you need to know topology. This is well quite obvious. Uh, but uh, is it correct that you need to be able to specifically map, given headers of particular measurement packet, map it to specific links? Because all the data center networks are usually using uh, quite wide equal cost multipass inside. Oh yes, uh, exactly. So, so uh, for example, in in the Google Jupyter testbed, we we have like multipath, and and but we like use the trace route to figure out the path for the pro packets and so on. So yeah, you are able to map packet precisely to the link. I'm asking because one of the very specific changes uh, we sometimes observe is that uh, you have a network, you have some change of topology. You may be uh, after that change back to previous topology, but hash mappings could still be changed after that. So you nominally have the same topology, but packet mappings are not valid anymore. So, so do you, so can we take, like this sounds very interesting, but perhaps you want to okay, take this okay, offline okay, for the break. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>